Thanks everyone for your patience. I'm now delighted to hand over to Paul Killoran from Exordo. Paul, over to you. Great stuff. Uh, hi everybody. Um, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Most people make aims, but you got it spot on. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here with you all today uh, in this lightning talk. Um, so just a, a little bit about me and a little bit about my, my company. So I'm the founder and CEO of Exordo. What is Exordo? Exordo is a software event software platform. So Mark and the team have done an incredible job organizing research to reader. There's about 160 or so participants here today. So I want you to imagine what happens when you need to scale up to 1,000, to 5,000, to 10,000 people, or if you're trying to run about 50 or 100 events a year. So essentially what Exordo does is we provide the power behind the uh, workflow tools necessary to, to scale something up, particularly that is a technical conference, because in a conference like that, you've got 1,000 or so presenters. You need to do the peer review. You have to manage integrity. You need to build sessions. You need to take payments. You need to manage their publishing workflows. You need to do proceedings. The list goes on and you get more and more gray hairs as as every year goes on as well. And so essentially that, that is the, the, the problem that Exordo solves. And in particular, we are specializing in the scholarly um, event industry, which also means our support team are uh, open and aware of the nuances and the peculiarities that uh, researchers and scholars bring. So that, for that reason, I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a context as to why I am in a position and qualified, therefore, to talk about <coughs> scholarly events, an untapped treasure trove of insights and data. So um, just to set the scene a little bit, I, I use this, um, this, this picture effectively to map the research life cycle that we have. OK, so for me, events are they're everywhere. Right? It, it isn't just in the, the beginning, the middle or the end. They are everywhere and they are part of the entire discussion. And so if we look at how research makes its way through this cycle, you know, everywhere from where we prepare and conduct research to when we publish and share research to when we discover and read research. And of course, when we assess and fund that research and, and, and ultimately how we make it out into public policy. Research are absolutely everywhere because we always need to share and discuss the work that we're doing in a given moment in time. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is take you through some of these stages and let me share with you the types of data that we have at our disposal that frankly are going unused uh, today. So let me ask you a question. Where does research come from? Have you ever thought about that? Where does it actually come from? And what, what amuses me sometimes is when I come to conferences <clears throat> like this one, I hear we need to have this idea, we need to have this idea, we need to have this idea, we need to we need to improve the way we have discussion with colleagues, or we need to improve ways we can read the literature, or we need to create online communities. And so I always smile because for me, conferences does this already. And for some bizarre reason, I think events get completely ignored. And perhaps it's because of the logistical challenges that come at running at events and scaling events that makes it sort of prohibitive for us to do this. But essentially, my point here is that as we think about how we prepare and conduct research, many of the elements of innovation are already built into events right from the get go. Um, and I want to put it to you. Imagine. Imagine if the corpus of insights from all of the conferences that ever took place in every single discipline were easily and centrally accessible. We focus far too much in my mind on the, the finalized article in terms of journals. OK, preprints are have started to emerge more. But imagine the entire treasure trove of data we have. If you think about all of that content that doesn't get the recognition necessarily that the journals get, but is hugely valuable into that very early stage. We see early career researchers bringing forward their first ideas, their first piece of work. Imagine how powerful it would be if we captured out all that data in a non-sided way. Oh, excuse me. Oh, okay. Um, there's like a sniper somewhere with a crosshair in my head uh, in case it took over time. Um, so if, if I um, if I uh, if we think about how we publish and share research, this is a statistic when I share it with people often blows their mind. 37 percent of all of the content that is published in conferences ends up in a journal within two years. 37 percent. Most of you go, that's mad. That doesn't exist. But if you think about it, it does, because early career research in particular, it's their first outing. And if they're if they're presenting a initial abstract or a paper on T, chances are when you see their final journal publication at the end of their PhD, it's likely going to be on T, and it's likely going to be with the same set of authors that they wrote the initial paper with. So the opportunity here, effectively, if you if you take a step back and you think about it, conferences present a pipeline of articles for later consumption in journals. It's incredibly powerful. 
We can do that in the short term in terms of a direct link. We can ask somebody who's been, you know, one of the better papers at a conference for a special issue, or we can take the view, we're going to take a longer term view, and we're going to nurture those authors and that idea downstream until a year or two later they're ready to present and submit to, to a journal. So if you're a publisher and you're concerned with how can we manage the pipeline of articles, that's it. So let's look at how we discover and we read research. One of the things I love, and Mark is incredible at this, is conferences don't necessarily prescribe you to a particular form. <clears throat> Look at this conference. We've had debates, we've had panel discussions, we've had workshops, proceedings. There's, you know, there's so many different ways in which conferences, what conferences let you do is they let you take a conversation, whatever form that you want it to be, and have that conversation in an unstructured way. Again, imagine if you could browse all of the conversation that your community is having uh, in a non-siloed systemic site way. That would be incredibly powerful, but oftentimes we come here to London, the BMA house, we have wonderful conversations, we pack up the bus and off we go, and those conversations get lost. And then finally, the only, I've limited on time, so I won't go through the entire live circle, but the other one is on the, from how we fund research. So the thing that I love about events is, and many reasons maybe you're listening here talking to me today, is that when you go to an event, you will hear the leading edge of what's going on. It's where the news first breaks, the, 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 the murmurings of that first idea start to emanate. So what are the hot topics if you're a funder? Who are the rising stars? Who are the experts? Um, it's an incredible way to see all that coming at you, you know, like a train coming down the track. And again, we often talk about how we measure impact of research. I'm not advocating this should be the only way, but we, we talk a lot about citations. But what if we measure the impact of research based on the live discussion that it, that it generates or the author engagement around that piece of research? So as you can see, as I talk through the various different stages of the research lifecycle model, effectively, and, I, and I, 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 held this, I hold this view very strongly, when you organize a conference like this one, you see the scholarly publishing industry coming together, the conference is the embodiment of the community. What I see in my platform is the data from that assembly. So effectively, what I'm doing is I'm creating a data model of the entire community. I have that for free within my platform, and it is being ignored and underutilized by the scholarly public industry. So effectively, if we measure all the data from it, we're measuring the community. Why am I here? I'm here because we need to join some dots. Um, we are a powerful platform, and the way I think about ourselves sometimes, we obviously have tools that solve workflow problems and help with logistics, but behind the scenes, we are, we are a massive sensor of data, and data that isn't going anywhere right. And we don't need more islands. We don't need us to decide that we're going to be the next bit. We want to work with others, and we want to let this data flow downstream to where it can have the real impact that I think the scholarly industry deserves. So come find me. That's my email. Laura Harvey is there, our Chief Customer Officer as well. Come talk to us. Let's join some dots. Thank you.